good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome to, in fact, INE's uh, understanding and implementing NAT on Cisco ASA firewall. For some of you who do not know me, I am uh, Rohit Pardasani, and I am a full-time instructor with INE. Been in the industry for about 20 years now. I have five CCIs, CCI and route switch, security, voice, collaboration, and service provider. So today our main focus is going to be on the ASA NAT feature. How does how ASA is different from the iOS XE? So we would focus on ASA mainly. And uh, we would look at different kinds of NAT on ASA, what support we have. So basically dynamic NAT, dynamic PAT, uh, static NAT, static PAT. We would look at uh, different sections of NAT, like section one, section two, and section three, the order of NAT, how NAT, um, uh, basically the lookup for NAT happens in the ASA. We would also look at some packet tracer commands to see the order of operation for NAT. Now, if you look at uh, NAT, obviously ASA supports NAT. It supports dynamic NAT. It supports dynamic PAT. It does support static NAT, static PAT. It supports twice NAT also. Um, the key difference between the word dynamic versus <clears throat> static is that dynamic is many private IP addresses are hidden behind a range of public IP addresses. Typically, you would use dynamic IPs when, let's say, you, as the LAN segment, want to access the internet. However, the, the key limitation in dynamic NAT is that it's many to a range, which means if the range of IP gets full or it's allocated to someone, the traffic, the remaining traffic gets dropped. It's an IP to IP translation. The port address does not really get translated in dynamic NAT. So let's say if I have a LAN segment, maybe 192, 168, 1.0 slash 24, and that is trying to access the internet. And let's say I have five IPs, five public IPs available. So at that point of time, five source addresses would be translated to uh, the five public IP addresses. The source port, destination port does not change. The destination IP also does not change. The only thing that changes in dynamic NAT is the source IP. So if five PCs from the LAN go outside, the six PC would get dropped. So that's dynamic NAT. Now, obviously that's really not convenient because I'm not going to go and buy hundreds of IPs because I have hundreds of PCs. So that's where dynamic PAT comes in, where many private IP addresses are hidden behind a single IP. The difference here is that the source IP gets translated to one single IP. So source IP gets translated. However, the source port also gets translated to a unique port. So that's, that's how the ASA knows that when the traffic is coming back, destined for an X IP, for an X port, it, need, it knows that, okay, this port was assigned to this PC. So he, he sends that packet back to the PC in the LAN segment. So the ASA would, would dynamically assign a random unique port for the source. So in dynamic path, source IP and source port gets translated. Obviously, it is unidirectional, so you can access the internet. Internet would not be able to access you. Even if you have access list, it doesn't matter because it's unidirectional. So the use case for dynamic NAT or dynamic PAT would be maybe, uh, let's say, a LAN trying to access internet, but nothing like internet trying to access you. For example, if you had PCs or, let's say, a web server, or maybe a TFTP server or an FTP server or an SMTP server in your DMZ, you would not do dynamic NAT or dynamic PAT because for that you require bi-directional communication because you may have users from the internet trying to access your web server. So you have traffic coming from the internet to your public IP. So that's where you would do static NAT. So dynamic NAT, unidirectional, only source IP gets translated. As far as dynamic PAT is concerned, again, unidirectional source IP and source port gets translated. Static NAT is one-to-one -one translation. <clears throat> so one private IP address 
is hidden behind one public IP address. In static NAT, it is only the source IP gets translated. When your traffic is going from, let's say, inside to outside, or let's say your traffic is going from DMZ to outside. So in that case, the source IP gets translated. If the traffic is coming from outside to inside, the destination IP gets translated. So that's why static NAT is bi-directional. You can access the internet and internet can access you. Obviously you require access list for lower to higher traffic coming in from internet to DMZ, you require access list. But still, when once you have an access list, your, your, your web server would be accessible because static NAT is bi-directional. In static NAT, the source port or destination port does not get translated. It's only IP to IP. So you going out, source IP translation. Outside to inside, destination IP gets translated. So that is static NAT. Static PAT is, is where it's, it's not bi-directional static PAT. Static PAT is unidirectional. So if you go outside, you can translate the source and you can translate the destination. Typically, static path is used when you want to put conditions. For example, let's say if I say that this user, if he tries to access this branch office, then do a translation for him. Let's say if he's trying to access a specific port, maybe 7001. So if, if this PC goes to the branch office for destination port 23 or maybe destination port 7001, in that case, I would translate. So that, that's basically a condition where we, we are putting a condition that only if he's doing this, then do a translation. So there is where we could use static pad. ASA supports all of this. Now, obviously from implementation perspective, ASA commands have, have changed from the older ASA code to the newer ASA code. If you look at, I don't know if you guys have um, worked on ASA before, but if you had worked on ASA 9.2 and before, so anything which was before 9.2, so let's say 9.0, um, or in fact, it was, I think it was 8.6 maybe. Yeah, I think it was 8.6. So 8.6 and before. The commands for NAT was different. Implementing was different. Concept was still the same but the implementation commands was, they were different. So with the new code, I believe in the CCIE, it's probably 9.8. I think there's 9.6 also and 9.8 also, but um, obviously the code is different. The commands are different and that's what we are going to look at today. <clears throat> so ASA, if you want to implement dynamic NAT, or even dynamic path or static NAT or static path. There are two ways to implement this. One is manual NAT, so manual configuration or object-based or auto NAT. So two different ways of doing it. What do I mean by manual NAT? So manual NAT means configuring the NAT globally on the ASA, which means we are not really doing it <clears throat> under the object. We are going to be doing the NAT globally. That's called as manual NAT. If you configure NAT under the object, then that's called as object NAT or it's called as auto NAT. So whatever name you want to give. So when I use the word auto NAT, it means I'm doing the NAT under the object. If I use the word manual NAT, I'm doing it globally. Both Auto NAT or manual NAT, they both support dynamic NAT, dynamic PAT. See, dynamic, static, they're all methods of NAT. Implementation can be done with manual or auto. Now comes the preference. How does ASA prefer, uh, how does the ASA do a check of which NAT rule to match? So what ASA in the new code has done is he has divided or it has divided the NAT rules in sections. So we have three sections, section one, section two, and section three. So let's say if I have a rule in section one and I have a similar rule that matches the same traffic, let's say I had a rule that matches 192, 168, 1.0. So I have a rule that matches that subnet in section one. And I have another rule in section two that matches the same, same subnet. Which rule is going to match? Section one. 
Section one wins over section two. Now, if you look at the old code of ASA, static NAT took preference over dynamic NAT, always. We could not change that order. It doesn't matter how you implement it. It doesn't matter whether you configure dynamic NAT first and then static NAT. Even if you configure static NAT later, it still gives preference to static NAT, but that's not the case in the new code. ASA has changed quite a bit from NAT perspective. So here I could configure dynamic NAT being preferred over static NAT because the order of NAT is based on sections. So the first thing that he would do is he would check section one. In section one, he would go through top down. So rule number one is, is given preference over rule number two. And then again, rule number three. So he will always check section one first and within the section, he checks top down till a rule matches. If no rule matches in section one, then he would move on to section two. In section two, again, he would check top down. Rule number one in section two, then rule number two, then rule number three, rule number four, till whatever matches. If there are no matches for NAT, it goes to section three. In section three, again, top down. If no match, then no NAT translation would happen. So if all three sections don't match or don't trigger a subnet that matches that, that rule, then there would be no translation. So, so that's how ASA does the lookup for translation, that which rule should I match? So always section one is preferred over section two. Section two is preferred over section three. And within a section, it's top down. So it's very important that you plan your NAT configuration. See, in our case right now for the lab environment, I may have five, six, 10 NAT rules. But think about from perspective of production where you have thousands and thousands of, of uh, PCs or networks or uh, devices, and you really have a lot of NAT rules. So it's very important that you plan your NAT rules, your order of operation, or where should I place this NAT rule? Is it going to conflict with anything else? Is something that you should think of. So what I'm going to do is right now, I will show you manual NAT also. I will show you auto NAT also. Now, <clears throat> when I configure manual NAT, which is global configuration, it automatically gets attached to section one. Manual NAT is section one. Auto NAT is section two. So if I configure auto NAT, it will automatically go to section two. If I configure manual NAT, it would automatically go to section one. What is section three then? Section three is also manual NAT. But the difference is if I don't specify that this rule needs to go to section three, by default, manual NAT has section one. So if I configure manual NAT and I don't specify anything about which section to place this in, it goes to section one. But if I want, I can place the manual NAT in section three. So how would I plan my NAT statements? See, general rules, like for example, my entire LAN segment needs to access internet. That's a general rule. I would always place that at the bottom. Now, where would I place that? I would place that probably in section three because that's the last preference section. So I would place that there. Specific rules, I would put them right on top, maybe section one. So maybe I put like my um, NAT exemptions in section one. Maybe I put my VPN rules or mission critical traffic in section one. I put my gen, my, um, not so general, but still important, maybe in auto NAT. And then all the general rules, like normal traffic, normal internet access, which is matching the whole scope of the company, like everybody in the LAN segment. I would put that in section three. So doing it this way, it kind of helps you in not going back and rearranging your NAT rules because Order is extremely important. The order of the rule is extremely important. So like I said, section one is manual NAT, section three is manual NAT, section two is auto NAT. Now, why should you not do auto NAT? Why is auto NAT not recommended? Because with auto NAT, 
I cannot adjust or rearrange my NAT rules. So when I add a NAT rule, it automatically goes at the bottom of section two. So imagine if I had hundreds of rules in auto NAT and I need to add one NAT rule, it would go at the bottom of, sec of section two. But what if there's a conflict and maybe uh, rule number five in section two is matching the same NAT rule, which is the last rule that you created. In that case, with AutoNAT, I'll have to go and remove all my 100 NAT rules and then maybe edit that in a notepad, put my new rule on rule number five and re-edit all the remaining rules and then re-add the NAT rules. That's really not convenient. With manual NAT, I can just add a NAT rule and say, place this in rule number five. So whatever was at rule number five goes to rule number six automatically. So that's the best part about manual NAT. That's why manual NAT is recommended and you should not use auto NAT. I personally don't really use auto NAT that much. I use manual NAT mainly, but I have seen a lot of organizations still using man auto NAT. Um, I guess maybe they prefer that, but I personally do not recommend that because you cannot really adjust. It's like saying an access list which is a numbered access list. You cannot edit the uh, numbered access list. With named access list, I can remove something and I can add something, I can add a line. So named access list is better than numbered access list. It's the same concept that you should use probably manual NAT than using auto NAT. So for demonstrating NAT, for demonstrating dynamic NAT, and we look at packet tracer also, for demonstrating that, we would be using this topology here. It's a pretty straight, simple topology. So I have CSR5 on the left side, which is kind of going to act as the internet. ASA, and then on the LAN side, on the inside, I have CSR8, which is going to act as a PC in the LAN segment. And what I have pre-configured, just as a setup, I have pre-configured OSPF here. So there's la in the LAN segment, I am running OSPF. And there's a default route being advertised by OSPF. So 0 .0 .0 .0 slash 0 is being advertised by OSPF. This side, the WAN side, is not running any routing protocol. ASA has a default route to CSR5. So there's a default route here which is pointing to CSR5. So as of right now, CSR8 and ASA1 can communicate with each other through OSPF and CSR5 and ASA can communicate with each other because of the default route. But eight and five would not be able to communicate at this point of time because there's no routing. CSR5 on the internet does not have route back to the private IP address, which is running on CSR8. So it's pretty much like how you would normally see. Um, so for, for, for CSR8 to get access to internet, we have to do NAT. That's what we would have to do. So the first thing that I'm going to demonstrate to you is going to be dynamic NAT. And I will first show you auto NAT. So I will not do it manually. I will show you if, if you have to configure dynamic NAT and you're using auto NAT, um, then how do we do that? So everything in the ASA is object-based. You have to create objects. Unlike the old ASA code where we didn't need objects, we could just directly put a NAT statement with the IP address or the subnet. But with the new ASA code, we have to use objects or object groups. And it kind of makes sense because let's say if I had a web server, maybe I had like five, six servers in my DMZ and uh, maybe their IP address changes. What's going to happen? I would have to go back to all my NAT rules, remove them, even if it's manual NAT, I will have to remove them <clears throat> and re-add the NAT rules with the new IP. But if I do it object-based, 
it's pretty straightforward. All I do is change the IP in the object and the NAT rule gets updated automatically. So that's why with the new code, objects or object groups is mandatory um, than using a straight IP. So let me quickly show you. So if I look at CSR8 right now, and if I do a show IP route or SPF, I do have a default route. Can I access CSR5? So let's say if I do a ping to 150.551, which is the loopback of CSR5, I would not be able to access that. Again, many reasons I'm not able to access. One reason would be that there's no route back. CSR5 does not have a route back to CSR8. The second reason would be uh, AS is blocking the ICMP echo reply coming back because it's not inspected. But let's say if I do telnet to 150.551, uh, ASA is going to permit this traffic to go out. But again, the traffic gets dropped because reverse traffic, there's no route. So I have to do NAT. So let's do NAT. What I would do is, so this segment right now between the ASA and CSR8, that I believe has been configured for 10.0.0.0 slash 24. I believe it's slash 24, but that's the network. And what we would do is we would, we would map this entire subnet to a range of IP. If you remember, I told you that dynamic NAT was many private IP addresses hidden behind a range of IP. So let's uh, nab the, this entire range to 155.1.35.101.202. So I'm just giving two IPs. So what's going to happen? Once the first PC from the LAN goes outside, one IP gets allocated. Once the second PC goes outside, the second IP gets, gets allocated. What happens when the third PC from the LAN goes outside? When the third PC goes outside, when the ASA gets the packet, he sees that, okay, it matches a NAT rule. It matches the NAT rule, dynamic NAT rule. Since the NAT rule matches, if, in fact, it's a condition, if a NAT rule matches, you must translate him. You have to translate him. So ASA sees that, okay, I have a traffic, coming from the LAN segment, it matches a NAT rule. However, I do not have a NAT public IP available in the NAT pool. I don't have an IP available. Both the IPs have been taken by the first and the second PC. So what does ASA do? Since no IP available, drop the packet. ASA would drop the packet if there's no IP available. So that's the problem with dynamic NAT. And it's many to a range, but only how many of a range IPs you have, only those many PCs can go outside at, at any given point of time. Let's try this out. And I will do auto NAT first. So let's go back to my ASA. Let me in fact take this here. So it goes away, all right. So as of right now, if I do a show run NAT, I have absolutely no configuration. If I do a show run objects, I have no objects, no object groups, nothing has been really configured. Only thing has been configured is IP address and OSPF on the LAN side. So this is my show run interface. I have my IPs configured and show run router OSPF. I have OSPF configured and show run route, uh, route, show run route. I have a static route configured towards the WAN side, towards internet. So let's go and do the NAT. Now you remember I said that auto NAT means configuring the NAT under the object. How many objects would I need if I was translating the entire LAN segment, which is 10.0.0.0 slash 24, to a range of IP, which is 155.1.35.101 to 102. How many objects would I need? I would need two objects. One that matches who I have to NAT, and one that what should they be translated to. So two objects needs to be created. Let's create them. So the object 
network. It's a network object. And let's name this as, um, let's say, public range, whatever name you want to give. Obviously, give relevant names. I'm just using public range. And here I would give my uh, subnet, or in fact, range. So range would be 155.1.35.101 to 155.1.35.102. So first object created, show run object. I have a public range created, which starts from 101, ends at 102. Let's create another object that matches who we are natting. So object network, let's, let's put this as LAN. 10.0.0.0, just any name. Here I would say subnet 10.0.0.0, 255, 255, So now I made the object for who we are natting also. Now I need to configure NAT. For auto NAT, I would do the NAT under the object. Now I have two objects. Which object should I configure NAT under? It should be your pre-NAT network. So I have two objects, right? Show run object. I have, this is my post-NAT network. This is my pre-NAT network. So who we are NATing, that's where you go under that object and configure a NAT. So I would give the command NAT. And then I say open parenthesis, uh, real interface name, mapped interface name. So now, Always visualize your traffic flow. So if you look at the diagram, visualize your traffic flow. Where's the traffic coming from? It's coming from LAN. Which interface would it hit first? Inside. Where is it going? Outside, to internet. So which means there are two interfaces involved in this transaction. Inside, going outside. So my pre-NAT interface or the real interface would be inside. And my post-NAT interface or the mapped interface would be outside. So I would go back and say, open parenthesis, inside, comma, outside. That's what the syntax says. You give inside and then outside. So give your internal interface name, which is the pre-NAT interface, and then give the external interface name, which is the post-NAT interface. Let's close the parenthesis. And now I have options here. A common mistake is that people would use any of these three commands. Don't use these three commands if you're doing auto NAT because this is a configure mode command. It will accept the commands and will configure it in manual NAT, as manual NAT. If you're doing auto NAT, you have to use network object mode commands. So then I would directly say, are we doing dynamic NAT or dynamic PAT or are we doing static? Right now I'm doing dynamic. So I would just say dynamic. What's next? Uh, mapped IP or mapped object. So I'm already under the object, correct? I'm already under the pre-NAT object, which is the LAN segment, 10.0.0.0. So you're asking me that object, which is 10.0.0.0, that network should be mapped to what object or what network? We will map this to public range. That's all we need. So if I do a show run object now, look at this, it doesn't show up. The show run object does not show my NAT because it actually creates, um, it actually separates your running config. So if I actually do a show run NAT, you would see that it's under the object. It's under the same object, but you see it separately in the running config. And um, if I now do a show NAT, you would see it's gone under section two, rule number one. So it's auto NAT, section two, rule number one. So what's going to happen when the packet reaches ASA from the LAN segment? ASA will say, okay, uh, do I need to NAT this traffic? He will first check section one. Is section one there? No, no rules in section one. So move to section two. In section two, he will check rule number one first. Does it match? Yes, it matches. So do I have an, do I have an IP available? Yes, 
not the traffic. And traffic gets translated, the source IP gets translated and it's forwarded across to the internet. Let's test this out. What I will do is I will show you with Packet Tracer. Or in fact, I can do a live test also. I can just go and do a telnet to 150.5.5.1. So if I try the telnet, it should work. It just did. So telnet works. And if I do a who, you would see that I don't see the original IP of, of R8, which was 10.0.0.8. I see the public IP, which is 101. So the internet does not really see my private IP address. They only see the public IP address. So the first IP was assigned 101. Now what happens when the second PC goes outside? Let's do a packet tracer. I don't have another PC to test this. I will use packet tracer to test this. So packet tracer input inside TCP 10.0.0.2, my second PC, source port 12345, Destination 15551, destination port, let's say 80, uh, web server. So HTTP. Let's try this. What happens? Packet came to the ASA. ASA did a routing lookup. Do I have routes to go to internet? Yes. Use the outside interface. Packet came where? It came on the inside interface. It's going outside. Do I need to NAT this traffic? Does it match any NAT rule? It matched this NAT rule. Since it matched a NAT rule, it must translate. So it got translated to the second available IP 102. It got translated. Now what happens when my third PC goes outside? So let's go and do number three. When the third PC goes outside, it matched the NAT rule, which you can see here. It matched, but look at the difference. Earlier, I was seeing it match the NAT rule and the additional information, I see the NAT translation. But here, I see it match the NAT rule, but in additional information, I don't really see anything, which means it matched the NAT rule, but there was no IP available, so it got dropped. It says allow here because ASA is kind of funky with these things, but if you go at the bottom of your screen, right at the bottom, you would see drop. Packet got dropped. But if you want to see why it got dropped, you could probably do a logging on and do a logging, let's say buffered seven. And let's try the packet tracer again and do a show log. You would see NAT pool exhausted, unable to create TCP connection from this PC to go outside. So packet got dropped because there was no NAT IP available. This is dynamic NAT. And look at the, the packet tracer. If I look at the packet tracer for the PC, which was working, the PC number two, for this, it, it did translate. And what did it translate? You remember I said dynamic NAT only translates the source IP. Source IP changed to this address, source port, remain the same. Source port did not change. Destination IP did not change. Destination port did not change. This is dynamic NAT. And I configured this as auto. Now let's try the same thing as manual NAT. If I was doing manual NAT, all I have to do is configure NAT globally. Don't configure it under the object. Configure it globally. So NAT Again, the syntax is the same, open parenthesis, inside, outside. But the difference here is I would use configure mode commands. So I would now say source. If you want the rule to go to section three, you would say after auto. So put this rule after auto, which is section two. So it goes in section three. If I don't specify after auto, it means it will go by default in section one. So let's say, and if you want to, let's say, insert a NAT rule somewhere in the middle in section one or section three, you can give the sequence number. So right now I'll just say source. What are we doing? Are we doing dynamic NAT or are we doing dynamic PAT? We're doing dynamic NAT. So let me in fact create one object just to show you that section one wins over section two. I'll make one more object. Let's say object um, or let's say public range two. 
and say range 155, 135 dot, let's give 201 to 135, 135, 202. And let's go ahead and create a nat rule now. So nat inside, outside. Source dynamic. Now it's asking me, who are we natting? So the real source. If you remember in object nat, it never asked me the real source. It directly asked me for the mapped object because I was already under the object of the real source. But in, in manual NAT, you're actually doing it globally. So I have to specify who we are NATing and what they should be translated to. So my, what's my real source? I believe it was the LAN, some name I gave, which should be in my NAT rule. This is one. So who we are NATing? We are NATing this guy, this object. What are we NATing him to? We are NATing him to public range two. Done. Now, if I do a show nat or show run nat, you would see I have two nat rules. One is under the object, one is globally. And if I do show nat, this went to section one. Section one, rule number one. Now, in this case, when the same subnet 10.0.0.0 tries to go outside, what's going to happen? Traffic comes to ASA. ASA does a routing lookup. Do I have routes to go to internet? Yes. Do I need to nat this traffic? Let's check. So he starts with section one. Checks rule number one. Does it match? Yes. So it never goes to rule number two. Right now, rule number two is irrelevant. It will never match. It will never match for 10.0.0.0. It's the same concept as access list. If you have a permit statement first, and then you have a deny statement, obviously the permit statement will win because it's above the deny statement. The same concept of access list, top down. So section one wins over section two. So he checks section one first. In section one, a rule matches. So he stops and executes that rule and never moves to section two. So you would see that in my, in my packet tracer. Let me do a clear xlate just to clear my translations. And let's try packet tracer again. I believe, yeah, so let's try packet tracer. I will try with the first PC. First PC went outside, what IP did he get? 201, he did not get auto NAT because section one wins. When the second PC goes outside, he should get 202. He got 202. What happens when the third PC goes outside? Do you think this time, since there's no IP available in section one, do you think he would go to section two? If you say the answer is yes, then I would say that's wrong. If a rule matches, it only executes that. It will never go below that. So, so if I do uh, rule number three, it matched the rule number one in section one, but there was no IP available, packet got dropped. So the, this rule now, which is rule number one in section two, this is irrelevant. It's not doing anything. It's never going to match. So that's why it's important that you place your rules correctly in the right order. So always general rules at the bottom, um, some specific rules on top, and then above that, all the NAT exemptions is what you can put on top or your VPN rules or mission critical rules. You can put them on top. So this was manual NAT. Show run NAT. That's my configuration. It's where I have configured dynamic NAT. Now, what about dynamic PAT? Dynamic PAT was many private IP addresses hidden behind a single IP. So it's hidden behind a single IP. So how, how is that going to work? Obviously dynamic PAT is more preferable than dynamic NAT because dynamic NAT, I need 100 IPs, 100 public IPs for 100 private IPs. That's not scalable. 
So we would do dynamic pad. So many to one. But here, the source IP and the source port would get translated. So let's try and do that. Again, I will show you both. I would show you um, auto and I would show you manual. Let me go and clear this. Let's do a clear configure NAT. So show run NAT. I have no NAT configuration. And let's do a clear XLIT. So I only have objects, okay? Let's make an object for the path translation. Now, in if you're doing dynamic NAT, you, you need to have at minimum two IPs, which I gave here. At minimum, you need two IPs. You can have more IPs also, but you need to have a minimum of two IPs if you're doing dynamic NAT. If you're doing dynamic PAT, then you require one IP. So you must have an object which contains one IP. Let's make that object network. Let's name this public IP. And here, instead of me giving range or subnet, I would say host. Host 155, 135 dot, let's say, let's give this as 150. So now I have one single IP. If I was doing AutoNAT, I would go and go to my, my pre-NAT object, which was, I believe it was this one. So go under my pre-NAT object and just say NAT inside, outside. Don't use source command, use directly dynamic, and then give the object name, which is going to be public IP. That's it. So you see the command didn't really change whether I was doing dynamic NAT or dynamic PAT. The command didn't change. What changed was the, the content inside the object. In dynamic NAT, in the object, I had two IPs versus in dynamic PAT, in my object, I had a single IP, but the NAT command remained the same, whether I was doing dynamic NAT or dynamic pad. What's the difference now? If I do a show run NAT, that's my NAT configuration under the object, so section one. So if I do a show NAT, I should see this in section one or section two, in fact, because it's auto NAT. And let's do a packet tracer to test this. Clear x -lay. Always do a clear XLIT before you test in a lab environment. So packet tracer, input inside, TCP 10.0.0.1, destination 150.551, uh, let's say 23 or 80, whatever you want. See the translation. It matched my dynamic path. Source IP got translated to this range to this IP, source port also got translated from one, two, three, four, five to one, two, three, four, five. It got translated. The reason I don't see it here, but the translation has happened. The reason I don't see it is because if that port is available, he would assign him the same one, but translation did happen. Let me in fact show you that. I will try uh, giving it a few times and then let's try one more time with a separate IP, but same source port. So in fact, you know what the packet tracer is like directly killing off my session once I finish the packet tracer end command. Let's try with a real uh, PC. So I will try with a real PC and keep my session on. So this should get translated to that 150 IP and the source port should also change. The first packet kind of takes time, maybe because virtual ASA. Okay, let's go back to ASA and just do a show log just to see the port number. So my port number was 19109. Let's go back to packet tracer. So PC number one is using the same port, 19109. See what happens. Source IP changed to the same IP, but the source port changed to 2803, randomly assigned by the ASA. 
So now this port is for this PC. Any reply that comes back for destination port 2803, ASA would forward that to 10.0.0.1. So this is dynamic pad where the source IP and the source port gets translated. I don't really see it in packet tracer because by the time I execute the packet tracer command and then I execute the second time, my first session is already gone because it's not really a actual packet. So if you try it with an actual PC or a router behind, then that session is kept on. It doesn't get terminated. So, so the port doesn't get free if my session is on. So right now my session is of Telnet is still on. So that port is busy for CSR8. So that's why ASA had to assign him a different port number. So it did a translation for the port also. This is dynamic pad, auto-based. Let's try it uh, manual NAT. Again, I'll try this um, globally, obviously because I'm doing section one. So let's make a new object and let's name this public IP2. And let's put the host as 155.135. Let's put this as 200. And I would give the command NAT inside, outside, source dynamic, who are we natting? We are natting the LAN segment. To what are we natting him? To public IP two. That's it. Show run NAT. I have two NAT rules. One is manual, one is auto. Auto is in section two, manual is in section one. Which NAT rule will match now? If I check now, and let's say I do a packet tracer again, I believe it is here. Yeah. If I do a packet tracer again, see what IP I got. I got 200. This port was available. So he gave it to him. It was available. Why was it available? Even though my session is still on, which you can see, because this is a different IP. It's a different IP uh, port is available. So that port is only mapped to an IP. So if the IP changes, the port is available for that IP. So it's a combination of just of IP and port, which they both are being translated. But if the second PC again goes outside, let's say 10.0.2, then he should get a different IP, different port. Let me try with CSR8. And let's look at the log. Show log. My port number is this one. So go back to packet tracer. Can you see my port number also changed? This is manual NAT. Manual NAT wins over auto NAT if manual NAT is in section one. If manual NAT is in section three, then auto NAT wins. The only time section three would be checked would be if there was no match in section one or if there was no match in section two, only then it goes to section three. Same thing for section two. If there is no match in section one, only then he would go to section two or three. But the advantage of manual NAT is that you can, you can change. You can, you can change the order if you want. You can do that. Now, there may be cases where you may sometimes want to do dynamic NAT. Let's say you have enough IPs, but so you want to do a dynamic NAT, but if that IP range is full, then pack should begin. You can do that also. So earlier with dynamic NAT, if I did something like, let's say if there were two IPs and two PCs are going outside, third PC gets dropped. I don't want that drop to happen. I want pack to begin. I can do that as well. Let's try this. Clear configure NAT. And let's do a clear X late. And let's exit this out. So what I can do for that, show run interface, or in fact, show run objects. I have these objects right now. Let me show you uh, manual NAT. If I want like do dynamic NAT first, then do dynamic pad, 
So you can do NAT inside. Or in fact, let me show you auto NAT first, so then we can do manual NAT. So if I was doing auto NAT, I would do this by going to my LAN object and saying NAT inside outside dynamic and then saying interface. Or I could say, um, what was the name? Uh, public range, range. I could do it like this and then say interface. So what does this mean? Show run NAT. What does this mean? That the LAN segment should be dynamically translated to the public range. If the range is full, then use the ASA's outside IP to, to do the translation, which means pad begins. So I'm putting a condition. Think of it like, you know how we give uh, AAA commands like AAA authentication, do authentication with radius server first. If the radius server fails, then go to the local database. Same concept. So I'm saying do dynamic NAT first. If the pool is not available, move to dynamic pad. Let's test this out. Let's do a clear X slate and let's try doing a telnet. Telnet works. Let's try with packet tracer with a new PC, PC one. Packet tracer works. I got 102. Let's try one more PC and let's change the port number also. This got pat translated to the outside IP address of ASA. So what happened? The first PC, which was CSR8, got 101, public range. Second PC got 102. Third PC got the outside IP address of the ASA, which you can see here, show run interface, uh, which is the outside IP address. So pat translation happened now. So pat begins. Once the IP from the range becomes available, PAT will stop and NAT begins. Once the IP is full, PAT begins again. That's how it's going to work. Same thing can be done even uh, with um, manual NAT. I could just go and say NAT inside outside source dynamic. We are NATing LAN to public range two, and then I could say interface as backup. So backup is interface. However, all traffic gets translated to the interface. So pad begins on the outside IP address of the ASA. What if I don't want that? I want that pad should begin on my, um, believe it was on my public IP or public IP two. I want that. So instead of you giving interface, you can give public public IP two, but that option is not available here. There's no option to specify another object. In that case, you would, you would, you would do object groups. So what, what you would do, let me remove this statement. You would create an object group of type network and say, let's say NAT, PAT, whatever you want to name it as, and say network object, object, um, what was the name? Public range two and network object, public IP two. So I put both my objects in an object group. And then I go back to my natural NAT inside, outside, source dynamic. We are NATing the LAN segment. To what? To NATPAT. So this is an object. This is not an object, it's an object group. So, so same thing happens now. Now what's going to happen? 
Once the PC goes outside, the first two PCs would get an IP address from the range of public range two. Once that IP pool is full or taken or not available, then it goes to PAT to public IP two. Let's see that. At this point of time, is rule number one in section two relevant? No, this rule is irrelevant now. It will never match because rule number one in section one will match. So if I do a packet tracer or maybe a telnet, if I do a telnet, you should see the first IP address going to uh, my CSR1, packet tracer input inside, TCP 10.0.0.1. One two three four five destination one fifty five five one eighty. That's my second IP two zero one. Third PC going outside would get pat translated to two hundred. Fourth PC also gets two hundred, but the source port is going to change. Packet tracer does not show that because that port is available once I finish the command of packet tracer. But if you have an actual PC, you will see the port translation also. This is dynamic NAT, dynamic pad. The, the last thing that we will look at is static NAT. Um, static NAT is bi-directional. So you going outside, source IP gets translated, outside coming in, destination IP gets translated. So it's, so it's bi-directional. Let's say, we had, uh, maybe we had a PC in the DMZ. Let's say a web server. Let's emulate that. So I'm gonna go back to eight. Let's do a show IP interface brief. Let's use this IP. Assumingly, this is my PC, which is my web server, maybe in my DMZ or my inside, whatever you want. So I need this PC to be able to access internet and internet should be able to access this PC. So let me go and do IP HTTP server and do a show run section line. Go to line VTY 0 to 15, transport input telnet, no login. And let's go and to ASA1 and create a NAT rule. I will leave these rules here. I will leave these rules here. Let's make one NAT rule. First, I'll make an object that matches that IP. So let's name this as web server private IP. Host is 192.168.1.8. That's my private IP. What public IP should they get? So object network, let's say web server public IP. Host 155.135. Dot, let's give this as 125. Assumingly, that's his public IP. And now I create a NAT rule. You remember I said that it's very important that you place your NAT rules correctly. As of right now, I have one NAT rule in section one. I have one NAT rule in, in section two. Section two is irrelevant. Irrelevant for this subnet. It is irrelevant for the subnet. But let's say if the IP, if the source IP is 192.168.1.8, both these rules are ir irrelevant because when it checks section one, this rule will not match. When it checks section two, this rule will not match because the source IP is 192.168.1.8. .1 so it's a different subnet, right? So it doesn't matter where I place at this point of time. It doesn't matter. So if I go and just create a NAT object, let's say manually, inside, outside, source static this time, and I gave map this private IP to this public IP. That's it. And if I do a show NAT now, you would see it's in rule number two now. Does it matter where I place it? No, because this is a separate subnet. It will never match for this subnet. 
and this is a separate subnet, it, it won't clash. So there's no problem there. So it's a one-to-one -one translation. Let's test this out. I will go to my CSR8, do a telnet to 150.15.5.1, sourcing from, I believe it was gig 1.50, 1 1.50, sourcing from that uh, network. I should see a translation happening. It did. Let's do a who. Look at my IP. 25. I got this IP. This is an old session, which I had. I believe I had multiple sessions. But uh, this is what IP he got. Which I can even see in Packet Tracer or in my logs. So outbound connection from 192, it got translated to 35.125. So now we know source IP got translated to that one static IP. Let's try from outside to inside. I will go to CSR5, which is the ISP or internet. And let's try doing a telnet to 155.135.125. I'm doing a telnet. Would this work? No, not because of NAT, because of access list, lower to higher traffic, it gets dropped. Let me temporarily go to ASA, create one access list, let's say out in permit, TCP, any to host. Now here, this is the key difference between old ASA code and new ASA code. In the old ASA code, your access list was hit before NAT. And in new ASA code, NAT happens before access list. So, so if my NAT destination NAT happens first, which means my public IP changes to private IP and then hits the access list. So this should always be a private IP, 192.168.1.8. EQ 80 and maybe 23, access group, out in, in interface, outside. So if I go back to CSR5 now and try telnet, it works, it went to CSR8. So you see static NAT is bi-directional. But let's say if I was doing a translation for CSR 8 slew back, let's say if I was doing a translation for this IP, 10.0.0.8, assumingly this was a web server that's going to be a problem because for that I need to think of, of where should I place it because let's in fact try this out let's say I make one object um, let's put this as web server 2 and host 10.0.0.8 let's make one more object web server to public IP and host 155.135.199. Now, if I look at my NAT rules, show NAT. Because of this NAT rule, this rule is irrelevant. So it doesn't matter. As long as, uh, let's say if this rule didn't exist, then this rule matters. So if, if rule number one in section one did not exist, then my new rule that I'm going to be creating, that should be above section two. It has to be above section two. If you want to place them in section two, then you'll have to remove this because you cannot edit auto NAT. You have to remove this, put your new NAT rule first, and then re-put this back. But if you're not doing auto NAT, as long as it is above this NAT rule, which means in section one, anywhere in section one, it's okay. But because I have this NAT rule here, that's going to clash. So if I actually go and just say NAT inside, outside, source static, and give web server to, gets translated to web server to public IP, uh, public IP, what did I give? 
If I just say this, what's going to happen? It's gone to section one, but rule number three, will this ever match? No, because rule number one will match. If rule number one matches, this rule is irrelevant now. It's not doing anything. So that's why I said, always put your specific NAT rules on top. So what I would do is obviously remove this. I would not do it like this. I would go and re-put this NAT rule and go back here and say, put this in rule number one. So now if I look at my NAT, so you see, I gave the sequence number. Now, if I do a show NAT, you would see that this is on rule number one. This has moved to two and this has gone to three automatically. So how should you plan this? Specific ones or NAT exemptions on top. Then so if you see, this is a specific one, it's on top. This is a less specific one, it's for a subnet. So it's below the IP one, specific one. And the last one that I would do would be like catch all NAT rule, which means everybody in the land, all remaining subnets, I would do something like this, NAT, inside, outside, uh, source, or in fact, I would say, first I would say after auto and say source dynamic, any to interface. Any means any source. I'm not defining an object, any source. So look at my natural now, where has it gone? Section three because I gave after auto. So what's going to happen now? What does this rule mean? It means if the web server two comes in, he would be statically translated. If the entire land segment comes in, he would be dynamically natted first, then pat will happen. If this web server comes, then he gets statically natted. This is irrelevant because of this. Everybody else who is not these, who is not this, any of these three rules, everybody else would be pat translated to the outside IP address of the ASA. So this is catch all. So this, I would normally put this in section three. I normally don't do auto NAT. I just do section one and section three. Section three is like catching all section one. On top, I have my specific NAT exemptions, VPN rules, like mission critical rules. And then again, in section one also, I have my general rules, but below the specific ones. But this one has catch all, which kind of is needed again to NAT all the remaining traffic for them to go to internet. So this is a static NAT on the ASA. What I will do now is I will answer some questions. Um, I see a question which says, uh, can you express manual NAT and auto NAT in some examples? I believe I may have answered those questions, that question because we did some examples. So, if you, if you do still have some questions about it, you can just email me and I can get back to you with more examples if you like. I see another question. What is the order of preference between NAT, ACL and route? So route checkup or route lookup happens first. Destination NAT happens next. Then source access list happens, then source NAT happens, and that's the order. So it's always routing lookup first, then destination NAT, then your access list, and then your source NAT. Then I see another question. If there's no IP in the range for the NAT, the ASA drops the traffic. So how can we know there is no more IP in the NAT. There are many ways to figure that out. You can see your logs or you can do a show xlate to see, or maybe a show xlate detail will show you that your pool is full. So mainly you can 
look at your logs. It's very easy to look at logs and get the, pull that information. So, but normally you would not have that problem because I have not seen anyone not use dynamic pat as a backup. Because I don't think you would ever have some kind of requirement which says do a dynamic NAT for a for some reason and not do dynamic pat. But in case if you do, then yes, the packet would get dropped. And um, un until the IP range is available. Okay. Then I see, uh, in which case can I use section one NAT? Section one is manual NAT. So it's, it's the main, main one used. You don't want to use section two. Manual NAT is mainly used to, because it, you can rearrange the order. So it's, it's a preferred way of doing it. It's like saying do a named access list instead of a numbered access list. They both achieve the same thing. Auto NAT also achieves the same thing. But manual NAT is better because you can edit things. You can, you can reorder them. So it makes more sense. I see another question. Um, do you have to do a clear X slate if yes? I mean, every time you make a change in your NAT rule, then yes, you have to do a clear X slate, but you don't have to do a clear X slate in production because that would clear all your NAT rules. You can do a specific X slate, clear, clearing your uh, specific X slate. You can just do a clear X slate and give the IP. And then we have ASDM simplifies creating any type of NAT rules and visualize including rearranging NAT rules. What's your thought on using ASDM? I mean, ASDM is nice, it looks nice. I personally have always been a CLI guy. So yeah, I mean, ASDM is pretty easy to configure, but, but let's say if I had a competition of me with me, me doing the same thing with CLI and me doing the same thing with ASDM, I would probably win with the CLI because I'm much faster with the CLI. So, I mean, that, that's just a personal preference, a personal choice. But ASDM is, you can do pretty much everything. I see another question. How would you configure if you want to pat with two public IP addresses? Uh, pretty straightforward. Just put the two pub, two public objects. So create two public object objects, one for each public IP, and combine them in an object group and attach the object group to your NAT statement. So you'll have two public IPs. So, however, both won't be used. He will use the first public PAT IP. Once all the sixty-five thousand ports are full, it moves to the second IP. Um, I see another question in case of dynamic NAT, which IP should be allowed if there's an ACL in the inside direction? So I'm not really sure what that question means. Uh, so maybe you mean that uh, I have configured dynamic NAT and you are putting an inbound ACL on the outside interface from lower to higher. If it's lower to higher, that access won't do anything because dynamic NAT is unidirectional. You can go out, but out can come in. But let's say if you mean that applying an access list to the inside interface for traffic going outbound, then it's uh, your uh, pre-NAT. Because if you look at the order, routing lookup, destination NAT, then here's your access list, then is your source NAT. So if your traffic is going from inside to outside, who are we translating in dynamic NAT? Source IP. So has the source IP changed? No, because that comes after access list. So that's why we give the original IP, the private IP. If it's destination NAT, destination NAT happens before access list. 
That's why we don't give the public IP, we give the private IP. So in both cases, it's private IP always. So I see one more question that with dynamic NAT versus dynamic pad, the syntax was the same, except for the command in the object where we use a single IP versus a range of IP. Can you use a pad with a range of IPs? So if you want to use pad with a range of IPs, you cannot use one object with a range. Let's say if you have three pad IPs, you have to make three objects, one which each contains one IP. Because if you make one object with three IPs, it becomes dynamic NAT. So you have to make three objects, one for each IP. That would make it pat. And then combine that in an object group. Okay. So I hope you guys enjoyed this webinar. I believe I do have another webinar coming up next month. Uh, that's going to be uh, for service provider people, which is InterAS uh, L3 VPN. Thank you for attending. If you do have more questions, please feel free to email me.